Hello, I'm Brian Cody, one of the co-founders of Scholastica, which is a platform for academic journals, uh, journals to use a platform for peer review, production, and open access publishing. Uh, I'm sad I couldn't make it out to Cambridge for the event, but I'm very happy to participate in the Open Access Week festivities going on there. Uh, this talk is about DIY open access journals, um, and these are three main areas we'll be covering. Uh, first, um, what are the DIY open access journals and examples? Uh, benefits both for the system, for the journal, for readers, for scholars. I'm going to look at some tips and tools. So if anyone's working on a DIY uh, open access journal um, already or is thinking about starting one, you can have some concrete uh, tips from people who have done it. Uh, so first, why is Glasgow even thinking about DIY open access journals? Uh, part of this is recently we worked on a white paper uh, looking at where are journals going in the future? What will the model or models of open access look like? We had some great contributors um, who are listed here. Uh, so I got to speak a lot of very informed open access um, scholars and advocates. Um, and in that white paper, sort of the underlying dynamic, we know that where we are now, there's a lot of big publishers who charge quite a bit for generally gated access. So uh, sort of not the ideal <laughs> for what we want in scholarship. Uh, but the underlying forces are something I was really interested in. And so you see, you know, these corporate publishers have control for impact measures. Uh, these last two are the ones that I was really focused on, that they centralize journal control. So both by purchasing and aggregating contracts, uh, fewer and fewer people uh, actually managing journals, so there's centralization. And then the specialization of the entire publishing process. Part of that uh, probably came with both sort of the globalization of the um, academic journal model, also the move towards uh, both online and print, and eventually mostly online, but all the different data sets and standards. Um, but the journal publishers themselves, I think, benefited from framing and uh, professionalizing the publishing process because then that became a moat sort of around the business model. Um, in that white paper, um, the too long didn't read version is, uh, where I think those forces uh, led to where we are today. A lot of what we're seeing emerging around the, in the open access movement are the forces that are somewhat antithetical to that. So rather than cent uh, centralization, we see decentralizations. So we're seeing an atomization of the journal publishing model, so more individual journals, small publishers um, doing journals well. And at the same time, a despecialization. So also the tools of academic publishing being democratized. So um, again, these are two pieces that I see uh, happening within a lot of the different models that are going on within academic publishing. Uh, Bjorn Bren, one of the contributors of that, looks forward and says, you know, as these forces happen, uh, democratization, atomization, we're going to see that publishing as a service, not sort of a copyright-centric or content hoarding uh, business model. Within that, though, as we make that transition, uh, there's, there's been a hope that sort of open access itself is a solution to the serials crisis. Um, in this white paper, talking about these contributors, it became more clear that open access itself might not be a solution. It can make uh, access good for readers, but in terms of the cost of academic research, uh, it could actually be an evolution. We could end up sort of spending more money leaving academia and leaving the research environment going to corporate publishers. And how would that be? That you have open access content, so if anyone can read it, um, but it's extremely expensive. Um, you know, we have APCs that are five thousand, six thousand, ten thousand uh, dollars US. That can actually extract more money out of the research community rather than less. Um, and we do see some good models where the prices are very low that the article processing charges seem uh, sustainable, uh, but that's not generally true at the kind of corporate publisher model. Uh, so, in this white paper, again, one of the questions is what prevents article processing charges from sort of uh, continuing the serials crisis. Well, a lot of the models we see on open access seem to fight against this. Um, some really positive models. So the Open Library of Humanities, um, uh, where the consortium that funds these models, uh, some of these others people in the audience are probably familiar with, but either um, different fee structures, grants, university funding, a mega journal model, but in this white paper, one of the models that kept sticking out to me uh, was, of course, what this talk is about, <laughs> DIY open access journals. Um, so it's now trying to find that. Um, 
So what I see a lot of uh, in this model that seems common, or maybe it's a definition that is proof sent, I'm not sure of the right ontology there, is that the workflow tends to be so focused around a single journal. Um, so these kind of DIY journals tend not to be trying to scale um, the same as publishers traditionally have. Sometimes uh, it is simply one journal or one or two. Um, they also tend to be born digital, so they they are thinking about the online version of the article as a canonical, not as a secondary to the print or the, even the PDF. So the idea of full text, you know, HTML or full text XML being the native version, uh, rather than again a sort of byproduct of a PDF workflow. Um, a lot of these journals have volunteer editors, a lot of volunteer staff. Sometimes they're supported by institutions. So I see a lot of university librarians um, supporting journals as part of their role, um, some departmental administrators, uh, but generally, you know, you don't have a large paid staff. They also, DIY open access journals tend to not have a lot of money. They have a lean budget. Um, I think because of that, they can be very efficient. Um, and we'll talk about this more in a little bit. They tend to be using a wide range of tools rather than a big enterprise software package or outsourcing um, sort of a, a large uh, service provider who's going to do everything. They tend to mix and match tools um, in an efficient model, uh, partially because of that budget. One example I'll share is Sociological Science, um, so a sociology journal. Um, this is a group of um, great professors um, and researchers got together and started this, I think in 2012. Um, and they, uh, they use Scholastica for the peer review, but they're publishing it themselves. I'm talking more about that. They recently put out a post I thought was amazing. So their content's open access, but here on the right, they actually listed their entire tool set. So as a DIY journal, they actually said, look, here's everything we use. Um, and a lot of the tools here are similar to what I see with other technology companies. Uh, Scholastica were based in Chicago, I know a lot of other companies. And some of the tools on this, Trello, Zapier, um, Stripe, these are uh, tools that sort of scrappy startups use when they're trying to uh, you know, be efficient. Um, and then Successful Science also partners with some um, service providers. Um, but this model is really interesting. They also have great marketing. I want to mention this. Uh, these are some of their tweets. This bottom one I'll highlight. Um, friends don't let friends read paywall, paywall sociology. Uh, I personally found that hilarious and based on the kind of likes and retweets, I think they've seen that's effective. Um, so again, that sort of scrappy uh, DIY journal where it also uh, echoes the ethos of the open access movement within their specific discipline. Another journal um, that I think is a great exemplar of the DIY open access journal model is the screen analysis started by um, a group of maths professors. Uh, one of them, uh, this is me pandering to the Cambridge crowd, uh, but Professor uh, Timothy Gallows, um, who's one of the people who helped really get this going. And uh, this journal is interesting not just for the fact that it's um, not working with a corporate publisher, really doing, uh, doing it through um, a lot of volunteers and then um, some grants and subsidies, doing it that way, that they um, actually publish, that they have this great website, which we'll see more of later, but they publish as an archive overlay journal. So the preprint exists on archive.org, and then the final paper, even though it's published in the journal, also ends on archive.org. Um, so it's a real, sort of scholar-friendly um, model uh, where they define how they want the final content to be distributed and where they want the final content to live. So these aren't external publisher deciding, it's the academics and the scholars themselves. Um, so again, it's a very, very fascinating model. For these DIY journals, where do we see benefits? Um, I mean, at the systems level, the move from Corporate publishers, where they uh, do these different services as sort of part of their uh, sort of multi arm strategy. When you move to a DIY model, each of these services ends up being an option. So the DIY journal uh, can use each of these individually and they can also trade them out. So they can use peer review software and decide that's not right for them and go to something else. Um, they can change out how they publish. Um, but generally, they're, they're thinking about these pieces as uh, discrete. Um, and again, where that's good is it moves towards that Bjorn Grimm's uh, quote we saw earlier, the idea of 
um, publishing as a set of services rather than um, a content hoarding model. And so DIY journals really live that, partially through necessity, um, but partially, I think, through design. They're really living, I think, the open access dream. Um, academics can retain control of copyright, um, usually through a Creative Commons license. But the cost of publishing is, I think, the biggest benefit of when a group of editors or academics decide to start or continue or support a DIY open access journal, the cost of publishing becomes under their control, um, or at least under their decision. Sometimes this stuff is hard. Um, but they're deciding publishing methods. It's not, again, a corporate publisher deciding how and what it is within themselves. Um, like we saw with the Archive Overlay Journal, how the research is finally distributed um, also ends up under their control. There are two main um, streams that I've seen for how journals uh, sort of move into a DIY model. One is this flipping journal, so from usually corporate control, subscription-based, to an open access model. Um, Gloss is probably the most famous model. Um, there's a lot of, um, uh, there's a maintained list of all the different uh, journals that have flipped. It's a, it's a fascinating model. I'm not, I'm not gonna really talk about that one. I'm talking more about the um, sort of like, called the startup model, so a journal who's being started from scratch and can sort of, uh, um, uh, is a new entity rather than one that is sort of converting from publishers, because the flipped model, there can be some legal frameworks um, that one has to navigate versus a new journal, startup journal, you don't really have to uh, worry about that as much. Um, but for someone who wants to do a DIY open access journal or is already doing and looking for some tips, um, I'm going to walk through some uh, some of those. So looking at peer review, these are more tips having talked to journals. Make sure as much as possible you can get all your data in one place. Um, and a lot of times people think, oh, it's easy, it's a spreadsheet. Well, email is one. Um, the files, a lot of sort of when they start, people are, have a spreadsheet with sort of status data or metadata, then they have files listed somewhere, and then they have email communication somewhere else. Um, and that can be slightly difficult um, to manage, and the more you can get those in one place, that can sort of keep, uh, keep things sane. Um, another one, scaling the personal touch. Um, DIY open access journals, often they're relying on the networks, um, they're relying on volunteers, and being able to uh, make sure that, that sort of the administrative work is happening as streamlined as possible or as automated as possible, but that communication is not that the communication with authors and reviewers and between editors is maintained, is sort of um, staying very front of, uh, I guess, in, in the forefront, rather than um, being automated, I think is something we've heard from journals, helps a lot. Another one's distributing the workload, especially from the start, um, having multiple editors at each level, um, and kind of related to that is having public um, tasks and deadlines, that way there's um, some social accountability, um, and informal accountability around every, everyone's doing work, everyone needs to hit these. Um, I've talked to some editors where when they end up with one person who's doing most of the work, that also becomes very difficult to sustain if that person wants to step down, no one wants to step into a role where they're doing that much work. Um, a tool that we have in Scholastica, um, sort of being able to have tasks and assign them and those being visible, again, email reminders, um, there's some other examples I'll show, but there's some very basic things like that, like a shared task list can actually uh, make a world difference for knowing who's doing what and sort of yourself feeling uh, like it's organized and that you feel that kind of correct amount of pressure to continue your volunteer work and support the journal. When you look at publishing, um, and I think most people are becoming much more savvy about the online sort of discoverability uh, requirements. Um, I would say even five years ago, journals, uh, you know, I, I looked at, they often were getting content online, but not having metadata. They weren't really thinking about how it was discovered, and even sort of on the other side, that their reader experience wasn't particularly good. Um, I've gone to journal websites and had trouble finding the link to read the article. Um, that, you know, these are things that can be basic, but if you're thinking about publishing it online, the more you can have um, a design that sort of have a tool that has figured this stuff out that can help. Uh, being mobile friendly, um, I'm still, you know, people share so many articles on Twitter, on Facebook, through um, email, where people are reading these and opening links on their phone, um, and being able to kind of peruse these on those is really um, good. 
one thing I'll mention this final bullet point, ongoing maintenance um, of software and the time it takes to do a workflow, that's a cost we encourage people to think about so that even though software might be free um, for uh, if it's an upfront cost, you know, for example, maintaining the database, having to upgrade it if it breaks, people not being able to read the content during that period, or um, hosting fees. Sometimes, you know, software can be free, but then again, just hosting it ends up being um, sort of a real cost. So thinking through all that um, can be helpful. Um, sort of one positive note, a lot of this is getting easier. Um, for example, um, uh, I'll show some quick things from Scholastica. So this is a screen of one of our example journals looking at peer review. So for example, I can very quickly find uh, manuscripts that belong to one of our editors, Corey. Uh, we can find articles where we have not invited any reviewers yet. Um, so of course that's very easy. Um, and I can do things like very quickly find a lot of information. So if I go to this article um, and scroll down, I can see who the authors are, the abstract, all the different files. Uh, one of the things is, that's really nice is we also build in email. So for example, I can see threads like um, emailing from Scholastica, the author responds from say his or her phone, um, you know, with an attachment. Our editor could respond from their Gmail account, but all that's saved in Scholastica. So when you're trying to figure out what's going on with the manuscript, you know, four months later and you don't really remember it's all there. Um, we also have an activity history, so you can see everything that's been happening, when things were completed, when something, uh, when someone was invited to review, et cetera. So that whole thread. Um, on the publishing side, we also, uh, this is that journal from before, discrete analysis. So not only does it sort of nicely work um, on mobile um, and it sort of looks good, but we can also, if we click in on these articles, um, you know, it's just very readable. Um, it's a nice reader experience. Uh, this journal again is an archive overlay, so the actual content's here. Um, another article that on Scholastica, this is one where it's um, full text, not PDF based, and you can do sort of the things you might want to do uh, when you're you know, sort of doing a DIY with an access journal. Embed content, um, have um, you know, content or data sets available, sort of whatever works for you and your journal. Um, a lot of what we do at Scholastica is trying to make software so that scholars can retain control um, of the, the scholarly publishing process. In my mind, a lot of that is reducing headache. It needs to be easy and inexpensive, um, and so building tools for that, I think, helps uh, DIY open access journals exist and be able to do what they need to do without feeling like there's either a high um, cost or a high time commitment to get done what they want to do. Speaking of open access journals, some of the challenges they frequently voice, one is, um, I'm actually starting at the bottom here, really keeping momentum that uh, starting the journal, there's a lot of upfront work, and then when you get up and running, keeping all the editors going, uh, sort of doing their daily, monthly, weekly tasks. Um, and so that's something keeping the excitement up, but having, having a workflow that's efficient enough um, and people who are dedicated enough to keep it going, um, the survivability of any sort of organization um, that's a challenge, but the more you can think about these as discrete tasks, that are not too onerous, that it's easy for people to not um, want to get busy with their normal sort of career, uh, their, their day job, if you will, being able to quickly do what they need to do or efficiently focus in on an article versus spending a lot of time trying to figure out where to log in or where's that information stored, what email was it that question in, that's when we hear people a lot of times get frustrated. Um, that comes in with staying organized. Um, and then within limited resources, one of the best tips I've heard is, you know, use your network. So reach out to uh, your library, your department, um, and your relationship, your dean, people who might have resources, either staff, um, uh, monetary resources, access to grants, um, time. Um, these can all make a big uh, difference in how sustainable a journal is. We, this is a workflow I've heard from a few journals is start with a strong network. So um, sometimes people have an idea of, okay, me and, you know, I'll sort of get it going and bring people on. The more you can launch it with a few people, that goes well. Clear peer review and publication processes. If you haven't done this before, talk to someone who's an editor now. Um, again, there's some examples 
um, at Cambridge, and you could probably speak with them about how they manage this whole workflow. Um, and being able to sort of borrow that as a template can be help, uh, helpful. A great tool set, I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, yeah, make sure to promote the journal. For tools, uh, there's a lot of great sort of low cost apps, and one of them I'll mention that I love is called Zapier. And that is a way to automate a cross app, so it's a sort of visual API integration, but it means you can do things like, if I get an email with this subject, create a task for me here. Or uh, if someone fills out this form online, add it to a spreadsheet, and then uh, let's, you know, send me a message in Slack or text my phone. You can do a lot of really interesting workflows with that. And so uh, without having to sort of use large enterprise software, which is um, maybe in the domain of the corporate publishers, you can have a very efficient workflow that's customized for your journal through tools like Zapier. Um, I'm also a big fan of Google Docs, so spreadsheets, um, slides, which you can read through now, um, and then some of these tools, which, especially when you start, are going to be free, social media, um, but you know, things like MailChimp. Um, you mentioned briefly these different models, but I think you know, across, you know, make sure to explore uh, all the different models that might be available to you to support this uh, for whatever funding you do need. Usually, there's some minimal amount, but generally between submission fees, low art processing charges, or grants. Um, the journal can run sort of on a very lean budget very effectively. Uh, so last year we do try and put out resources um, that are relevant. So you know, for this week, the Open Access Journal Starter Kit, uh, there's some of the resources in that white paper I mentioned, Democratizing Academic Journals. Um, and we'll make these available um, as well. Um, so I think one of the questions, so this was recorded, I'm now moving into live mode. So we'll see how this goes. All right, thanks. There you go. Oh, let's exit that. Oh, hi, Brian. Can you, can you hear me? I can. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. You. So you now. He's now coming out of the. Should be okay now. No, the sound sounds like it's coming out of there. Sorry, Brian. Can you just say hello again? Sure. Hello. Can you hear me? Okay. Is that loud enough? Great. Okay. Yeah. It's just that your your sound with your, with your presentation was coming out of big speakers, and now it's coming out of the laptop. Um. I have a first question. Um, okay. Just. Uh, does it cost anything? You didn't sort of really talk about that. If, if we wanted to start up today, the journal of, of the last day of Open Access Week 2017, um, what, what would it cost for us to do that? Sure. So on the Scholastica, peer review is $10 US a submission. Um, a lot of journals, when they get started, they're seeing somewhere between, say, 25 and 50 submissions in their first year. That 50 would be really good for a first year. Um, so that's $250 to $500 US. And then uh, for the website, which includes, we make sure all the content, uh, the metadata are correct, so it's available on Google Scholar and analytics around usage and the website, that's $99 US a month. Um, another thing, I was, sorry, um, just so you know, because I, I don't think you can see us, um, uh, my name's Danny Kingsley, I look after the office of Skullcom and I work with Lucy. Um, uh, one of the other questions I was having is, and you may not know the answer to this, but uh, a lot of researchers have concern about publishing in something that may or may not be around in the future. So, um, and I know Skullcom hasn't been around for a long time, but uh, are, there, are there percentages that you know about, about startups that then just disappear into the ether? And what happens to that information or published work if that occurs? Sure, so at least for Scholastica, all the data are the researchers, so we're just a platform. So you can always export everything and take it somewhere else. Um, so that's always should give people a sense of uh, confidence where it's your data. So the metadata, you can think about exporting XML to take all your articles. Uh, the content communication, that's all yours. For tech startups, I want, it's funny, I think it's sort of like a, in the restaurant business, you know, most sort of fail within three years. Uh, we're just starting our fifth year, so touch wood. I feel like we're past that hurdle. Uh, but we, uh, we plan on being around for a long time. But again, all your data uh, are yours, and so you can take those with you. Okay, so that's answering the question if Scholastica falls over tomorrow, but what I'm actually asking about is that, do you know about journals where a bunch of keen oh, early career researchers or something starts something up and then they all disperse and then it all gets lost? Sure, right, and that's something we've actually worked with journals where uh, sort of 
sustainability or the uh, some people call it the succession plan um, sort of goes away. That's obviously one of the purposes of um, dark archive services is if the journal goes away, the content will remain online. I have seen people obviously work with institutional repositories. So as the journal's fading out, the sort of school steps in and hosts the content. Um, that's one of the reasons when we talk about, I think in that presentation, uh, unfortunately I did it 12 hours ago, so my mind's a bit muddled. The uh, distributing the workload so that there is uh, not just one person, I would say that's the most common example I've seen is it's a passion project, one person's really moving it, and then a few years later, uh, career changes, and they hand it off to someone, and there's no one else who has the same level of commitment. Um, and so having a core group, multiple people who are involved, uh, I've seen be a, a, at least a characteristic that seems to lead towards more long-term sustainability. Uh, did that address your question? Yeah, that's great. Does, is that they've been worth think of anything you guys might want to ask? Okay, that's great. Thank you so much, Brian, for being so flexible and with us. Um, it's a shame we couldn't fly you over. <laughs> Maybe next year, you never know. Um, so thanks so much for your presentation. And thanks for being available to answer questions. Yeah, my pleasure. And happy OA uh, Open Access Week to everyone. Thank you.